because everybody calls me the Greek. Some love me, some hate me, and I catch a real big strike now. So we're going to go over it. How many of you guys have surf casters versus boat? Both. 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 I'll give you a little history on how I started life when I was a kid. I worked for a guy named Frank Dominic out of Island Park. Frank was a premier bass fisherman like I am today, but he was also a wholesale bait guy. We used to grind 25,000 pounds of bunker a week and sell them to all the tackle shops and party bugs. But Frank was a master at catching bait, and I learned about bait. And bait is the key to catching big striped bass. And a lot of people, Mikey, my friend Mike, made us some uh, things on some of the local bait here that you need to know. I'll give these out to you guys at the end of the seminar. So we're going to discuss today how to target big striped bass, which is going to be a little bit different than you're used to, but I'm going to go over more of the technique than the way I fish. Uh, the number one rule in fishing is finding the fish. That's your first job as a fisherman. And as I get older, it seems like the new generation doesn't really understand that. So how do you find fish? Does anyone know how to find fish? Bait. Bait's part of it, but the first thing is the bite. Follow Billy. <laughs> yeah, follow him. There's four bites that matter. There's a day bite, obviously they're biting in the daytime, a night bite. There's a tide bite and a time bite. A time bite is probably the least important, but it happens. That's a bite where at first light you get fish and that's it, you don't get another. Some beaches or some spots you, you place, you'll have late afternoon, you get a fish before the sun goes down, then it's over. But we're more concerned with it, the way it connects with fishing with the tide versus the, uh, the bite, the bait, and the way it happens. So if you have a day bite and it occurs on the end of the outgoing tide, <coughs> then you have to be there. So how do you, in the beginning of the year, how do you learn that? You don't know when the fish are biting, you know, you can't figure it out? Well, the two tides to start with are the end of the outgoing and the top of the incoming. And that, that's the tide bite. So the fish are biting on the tide. So you have to go out there and say, okay, I, I don't know this area, I'm gonna learn it. So we're gonna learn that. We're gonna fish the bottom of the tide and the top of the tide. If you don't have fish on that, then you switch to the other side of the tide. And that'll produce the tide bite. Then you got to figure out by bait, where are these fish going to be and why? There's, there's literally hundreds of baits that stripe in bass eat. Some are day baits, some are night baits, some both baits. And you have, that's your job to find that and figure it all out. And that's how you catch these big fish. All striped bass are structure fish. The better the structure, the better the fishing. If you're on a flat beach and there's just a tiny little hole, that's structure. Structure is anything other than flat. But the problem is that's not good structure, so it might hold one bass or no bass. The more structure, the more fish it holds. So you're always looking for good structure. If you're on a beach, and a lot of you guys fish the beach, if you look at a beach and a wave breaks and rolls for 50 yards, there is absolutely no water there. You want a pitch, a strong pitch is better. The stronger the pitch, if the wave breaks and goes up a couple of feet and that's it, you're in the right spot. Now that's an open beach without an outer bar. The, the bass will be right in front of you. So you don't have to cast 200 yards to catch a fish. You can cast from here to that wall and sometimes a lot shorter than from here to that wall. And you just gotta wait it out. Then there's other spots where if you have a sand bar, you don't wanna fish the big hole in the middle, you wanna fish the edges of the bars. If the wave breaks, if you wanna read water, and everyone does reading water. I've heard everyone read water, so I'm just gonna go over a little bit. If you look at a beach and you kneel down like this and watch the beach, you can watch the wave roll in. If the wave rises, breaks, that's the bar, and then if it rises again, that's the back of the bar, the inside. It's very deep there. Your bait should be there or your lure should be there because that's where the fish are. Bass do not come down a beach straight in this way. They come in at angles. So you want to fish. You never want your bait dead straight. Everyone goes to the beach, what's the first thing they do? They cast as far as they can. They hold their rod, half hour later they reel it in, they change their bait, and they do that for like an hour. Like, at what point do you realize there's no fish in front of you? Good bass fishermen move and they move all the time. Because you, the fish might be 50 yards to your right, but you don't know that. They might be 100 yards, you, you might not be reading the water right. Bass are very aggressive feeders, so if you don't catch a bass in the first 15 to 20 minutes, move a little and keep moving. Then we're going to get into wind and moon and tide. Certain beaches and everywhere you fish, there'll be a wind that produces and there'll be winds that don't. And you need to write this down. There's not a fisherman out there that shouldn't keep a log. 
You should have an accurate log of tide, of wind, of moon. Your best bites will almost always occur around the moon, especially a new moon, two days before to three days after. It varies off and on, but if that's the only time you've got. You need to fish them. So you need to fish. The moons will produce the most fish as far as the bite goes. The wind will tell you where these fish should be. If the beach doesn't produce, if you were fishing today on this beach in a southwest wind, a southwest wind and you beat these fish up, if the wind blows northwest tomorrow, there's probably no fish on that beach. They move. They don't like that wind on that beach. If you kept the record, you wouldn't be wasting your time going there tomorrow and say, gee, I had fish here yesterday. What happened to them? Find the beach that produces on the northwest versus the southwest or whatever your wind is for your area. Every area is different. So you need to find structure, you need the wind, you need the moon, everything interacts. The ocean's like a living, breathing thing. And after a while, you start to actually feel it. You know, a lot of the new generation doesn't have the time to fish. Like I fish seven days a week, twice a day, every single day. So if you're on the water every day, you get a sixth sense that you just can't buy from fishing twice a month or once a week. And you can feel the way it moves. You can feel when the fish move here. So, as an amateur or a beginner, how do, you, how do you get past that point to start to learn where these fish are? And to do that, you need to put timing when you're catching fish. You need to learn, when you're in a boat, and I discuss this with some of my friends a lot, everyone reads the high tide table, which is 100% useless. It's the current speed that matters. High tide is the highest the water gets. It's the vertical rise and fall of water. You need the current speed. So if you're in an area, like for arguments, if you fish Fire Island, the inlet says the high tide, say, at 12. The water doesn't turn to go out at the lighthouse for three hours. So if you left at 12 o'clock, you just wasted three hours of fishing time, but you're not catching zilch because you're on the wrong tide. So it's very important to get there when the fish bite and keep an accurate log of this. So after a while, every year is the same in the sense that once you know that it takes two hours and 15 minutes for the water to actually turn and go out at this point, it will always take two hours and 15 minutes to turn and go out at that point. So you don't know, when you look at the tide, it says high tide at 12, you're like, not where I fish, it moves at 2.15. So then you can go and fish correctly and you're not wasting your time, especially if you're limited. Second is you don't need to stay anywhere all day. You know, like you see guys, they anchor their boat, they fish for six hours in the same spot, you're out of your mind if you do that. So you need to check. If, if bass are feeding on a mussel bottom, there's multiple mussel bottoms in your area. If, if they were eating baby porgies on this bottom and you run out of fish, run to the next piece of bottom in line with the tide that have mussel bottom. And you'll start, you'll start to have a sense of how these fish move through the bay or through the ocean or down the beach line. You know, Everything is keeping records and keeping track. So when guys like me that catch a lot of big fish, I put in 45 years of doing this, you're not going to be able to do that right away, but you'll benefit from not wasting your time. Try not to waste your time. So your first job is finding the fish. Your second job is what, what bite do the fish do? What's the tide? What's the time? What's the current? What's the structure? And you've got to figure all that out. Everybody should learn bait because bait really, really matters. Is the bait a bottom bait, a top bait? So if you're fishing an area where, if, like years ago, we were fishing little flounders, which were real popular to catch big bass. Was, today, it's easier to catch the bass than the flounder. But if you were fishing with a little flounder, you knew that they were on mud bottoms. They used to be on, on, like at the end of June, they would be leaving the inlet. You would be here waiting for the bass. So now, same thing with an eel bite in the fall around the moon, on a full moon in October. The eels used to exit the bay by the millions. And there would be people waiting because the bass were there. If you write all this down and keep track, you'll start to not waste your time. And when you go fishing, you'll start to catch fish. You only learn when you catch fish. You learn nothing when you catch nothing. So the more fish you catch, the more you learn. And you adjust. If you have arguments, if you're fishing eels in a tide, as the tide progresses and gets stronger, if you were fishing from a boat, you should be lengthening the leader length for your eel. If you fish with a three-foot leader in a really strong tide, you won't catch as much fish as the guy next to you fishing a six-foot leader. But you would never know that unless you experiment. You must, you must always experiment and try stuff and write it down and see if it works. That's the art of fishing. If you're really good at this, you start to become more of a hunter than a fisherman, I would say. Because hunters know their prey, and they know it well. Fishermen don't seem to know that to me. Most fishermen go fishing and hope they catch something. I never want to go fishing and hope I catch something. 
I always catch something. You know, if you don't catch something, you get possessed, then you get, then you really get focused. And presentation is very big. The way you hook your bait, the way you fish it, the leader length, the, the, the distance when you're chunking from the line to the sinker or if you're free floating, everything makes a difference and it's up to you guys to learn what makes a difference. And that, that will separate you, the people that make the news and the people that read the news. Because I don't want to be the guy that reads the news, I want to make the news. So I want to be first. I want to be on the bite first. I want to figure out where these fish are all the time and why they're there. And that's one of the main reasons they're there. So think of all the baits we got out there. Like in today's world now, everyone is bunker crazy. They're all running in the ocean. The bunker schools, are, it's not as good as it was 10 years ago. It's getting worse every day. But that's not the only place to strike bass off. So if you want to go beat yourself up with the rest of those guys, go ahead. But there's bass, every, there's bass all over the place. You've got to find them. And there's a million baits. There's, we, on this list that I'm going to give out to everybody, the first, the first thing on this list is a digger crab. Some people call them mole crab. Does everyone know what that is? Well, just so you know, they spawn in July on the moon, on the new moon. You should all be on the beach fishing right in the wash. Because there's some big fish that come through on it. And you can catch them on bunker. You don't need them. You don't have to match the hatch. But there's a, there's a million other baits. There's days, if you're fishing, there could be kingfish, there could be lizard fish. There's so many different baits. There's squid in June. There's all different baits. You need to get a book, look up baits, look up when they come, when they spawn, because the striped bass will know better than we ever know what's living on the bottom of the water. There's days where you go over and you have no idea what's on the bottom. You can't see it. Even a recorder won't show you what's on it. I'm in the Great South Bay one day. In my entire life, I've never seen manta shrimp in the Great South Bay. We were catching bass in a 30, 40 pound class that was spitting them out by the dozens. And then they were big, eight, 10 inch, and they were, they were everywhere. Now, why would they be there? I have no idea. I've never seen them before and I've never seen them again. But this particular year, they were knee deep, knee deep. So unless you see that, you know, if you have, a, in fact, if you have a, if you're on a boat and you have a wash down, the first fish you catch, stick it down his throat and blow out what's in his stomach. It'll come right out. You'll see what he's eating, especially if you want to release your, your fish. And for those guys that release all their fish, there's no reason to have the barb on your hook, in my opinion. If you're really into conservation and you're letting your fish go, follow your barb on. If you're a good enough fisherman you keep pressure on your fish, you're not losing a thing. And if you do, you're letting them go anyway, so you probably save a lot of fish. Like when we release fish, I no longer I don't even take them out of the water. I release them right in the water right next to the boat. You know, that way they, they I only keep a fish now if someone actually asks me to eat one and that's not too common anymore. You know, so in our world where the striped bass is getting it's it's getting worse. The fishing is getting worse. There's less fish over less area. So, you know, we're gonna have to start paying attention now because we ran into this in the late seventies, eighties. We had the same exact scenario. We had a handful of real big fish, a whole lot of small fish. Middle fish was starting to dissipate, and the fishery just collapsed. So sooner or later, they're going to have to address that problem, in my opinion. But we'll see where it goes from there. Anybody got any questions? That was a sand flea you pointed out at the top. Actually, no, it's not a sand flea. It's a digger crab. It's a much different. Sand fleas are little. They're arched. They're very small. Yeah, digger crabs see. come up to about the size of a quarter. And in, in, uh, in July, on the new moon, they, they spawn. You'll see when they spawn, they have an orange, big orange dot on the bottom of them. But when, it, when they're spawning, if you notice in the wave, if you watch the curl in the wave, you'll actually see them rolling in the wave. And the big bass come right along. And it's not a great bite, and it's not a ton of fish, but they'll come right along and they'll just suck up what's up. You might get one fish an hour, you know what I mean? But some of them, are, we had fish in the 40 and 50 pound quest doing that two years in a row. Along the beaches, that's what it's called. Right on the beach. Yeah. And you, want, you can't miss them because they're big. And a lot of times when you, if you're fishing bait or even a lure, if you drag it into a sand, you snag one of them. Everybody snags one of them once in a while. And this and is North Shore and South Shore? This is South Shore. I'm not sure what the North Shore. I don't fish it as much as I used to, so I'm not that familiar with the North Shore. Can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> we only tell you how. <laughs> Otherwise, you have too much company. That's another thing. You get some big fish, tell your friends like three days later, because fish have tails and they swim, they'll be gone by then. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of company when you go. So, what else do you want to discuss? Current speed. Current speed? How do you figure it out? Current, you, there's, a, there's a chart for current speed that you can get, I guess now in today's world with computers, they probably have an app for all of that. 
You really need to know the current speed wherever you fish. It varies a big deal from place to place, tide to tide. But current is the key factor in striped bass. Striped bass prefer moving water over calm water all the time. So the, the better the water moves, the better the fishing is going to be. And it's usually always around the moon. But you catch, if it's a, listen, if you can only go fishing Thursday afternoon, by all means, go fishing Thursday afternoon. If you want to target really big fish, which is a tough thing to do, because first you have to catch a lot of regular fish until you understand how these fish move and think. If, if I go through my videos, we did a bunch of videos we didn't put out yet, almost all the time, the biggest fish is the first fish or the last fish. And there's a reason for that. When you... When you're in a school of 25 and 30 pound fish, now those are nice fish. They're not real big, but they're real aggressive. They can eat pretty much anything a 50 pound bass can eat because they can only hold bunker, hold blackfish, whatever you're fishing. They're so aggressive that it's hard to get through them to get the big fish that's there. I fish exceptionally heavy gear, by the way. I want a water ski at 25 pound bass. If you want to enjoy fishing and you fish light gear and catch one or two fish, your chances of catching a big fish suck because you will never get enough fish out of the way to open that door to let those big fish come through. If you watch these videos, it's very clear. You'll do 20 or 30 fish in a 25 to 35 pound class, and then all of a sudden you get a 47 or 45 or 52. It is so consistent, it's amazing. But to do that, you gotta get these fish out of the way. Or it's your first fish, which is your biggest, or your last fish. I don't like this scenario of hoping I get lucky enough to catch my first fish or last fish the biggest. I want to know. Second thing is, if, if you seriously fish like I do, the name of the game is bait, and how much do you take? If you run out of bait, you didn't take enough. You should never run out of bait. If you're on a bite and you go home, you missed it. So you, you should fish it out to the end all the time. You should always fish it out to the end. So. If you go to the beach and you got four bunker, if you got the best body of life, you're never going to know it. You'll have four bunker. Just so you know, if I chunk the beach, I go to the beach with a minimum of 15 bunker, and I have another 25 to 50 in the truck in case I get a good bite. So if bunker is expensive, you guys need to catch your own then. Then it gets much cheaper. So it's easy to do that. And, it's, and, and fresh bait's the key. Like anybody who says there's an argument between frozen bunker and fresh bunker, they need their head examined. There is no argument. There is only fresh bunker. And the fresher, the better. If you catch it yourself, amen to that. If you can't, your local tackle shop, if they keep it good, buy it there. And that, that'll really, that, that, that makes a major, major difference because when it comes to fishing bait, any bait, it's the slime on the bait that catches the fish. So if it looks pretty and it has no slime, it's just a piece of meat sitting on the bottom of the water that a fish actually has to see. So he has to swim over and see it to eat it. Whereas a chunk that's fresh cut from a fresh bunker, they can smell that slime coat from 100 yards away and they'll come right down tight and get it. So it's very important to keep your bait really fresh and, and real pristine. That's number one, you know. Second thing with big fish is, is when you, is finding them. In today's world with less and less big fish, it's going to take more and more time to find them. And that's where it comes in with your bite. Day bite, night bite. Now in our area, in the last few years, the night bite's been horrible. It's all daytime. And that could happen depending on, but that could change. That could change during the year, that could change during the month. So if you're fishing and you're catching fish, say, on an outgoing tide for three days in a row, and the outgoing tide goes into the night, they might switch over and feed at night because they like that particular tide. Or you might lose them all together. So that's why it's very important that you put your time into fish. And I know for a lot of people that's really hard, so if you can't do that, maybe you got a friend. If two of you are fishing, if you fish with your friend of one or more people, you should never start off fishing the same. If one guy casts far, the other guy casts short. If one guy's fishing something, this, the other guy fish something else. Once you find the fish, then you can all fish the same thing in the same way. But too many times I watch guys, if you go to the beach, it's very obvious, everyone casts as far as they can and just stay there and wait. If you cast far, the other guys will be right in the wash. And I mean right in the wash. You can almost see a barrel swivel. Because sometimes there's big fish there. And you won't know that if you're not there. The second thing you should do is reel your bait in right to your feet. Every, every minute and a half, two minutes, reel it two feet, three feet, four feet, three feet. Just keep reeling it. It gets right to your feet. Take it off, change your bait, and throw another piece out. If you don't do nothing, move down and do it again. You have to constantly move. The more you move, the better until you find the fish. Because that's your job. Your job is always find the fish. 
That's job number one. If you're just going out to have a good time and have a beer, God bless you and enjoy what you do. But if you really want to catch these fish, you need to put your time in. You made a statement that you said the last couple of years the night bite hasn't been that good. Well, we are. Well, we are. Yeah. Do you have any idea why that is? It's bait. Oh, it is. All of life in the ocean is bait. In other words, if you have a tremendous eel population, and it's got, eels are not a daytime bait, they're a nighttime bait. So the night bite gets very aggressive. If there's no more eels and they're feeding, like when there's a mullet run, which we haven't had a real, real mullet run since I was young, but if you had a real mullet run that covered 10 miles of beach, the bass are very aggressive just before first light till just after. It's a broad daylight bite. So when they feed that heavily, there's no need to feed at night. You might not have a night bite at all. So if you go out, you know, that's why if you don't know your bait patterns, you're putting yourself in a position to fail because if your bait pattern is all mullet and you're fishing only at night, he's catching fish and you're catching nothing and you're like, I'm not catching nothing because you're on the wrong tide. It's, it's just that they bite. So it's very important to learn the bait. What bait is in your area today? And how, how are you going to learn that? You know, there's hundreds of baits out there. I mean, you got mullet, you got herring, you got shad, you got bunker, you got, you got clams, crabs, soft shell clams, you got worms, you got spearing, you got, there's a million little baits on the bottom, there's porgies, there's blackfish, there's millions of baits. What bait is in your area this year? I've had years with his baby blowfish. Would you use a baby blowfish for bait? Probably not, but every bass we had spit out 20 or 30 of them. Is there a resource that tells you that? Yeah, there's, there, there's not a resource that'll tell you probably time and place and what's there, but it'll tell you what's in your area. So should any any good book, on there's, there's a couple of books out on bait, but any good book will tell you bait and the general time of year it's in your area. Other things you should know, you know what I mean? Like. The bunker, you know, the bunker when they start now and then they start migrating and by June and July they're up here in our oceans and they start coming into the bay. Flounder are leaving then. There's no flounder here in the middle of the summer, you know what I mean? There's little fluke, that's just as good. But whatever the bait is and whatever the predominant bait in your area, that's what the bass are going to eat. You know, when I first moved to Lindenhurst, there was a guy that owned the local tackle shop. I won't mention his name, but everybody knew him. I liked him. Most people did The first day I went out fishing, I was fishing live porgies, and very few people fished porgies in those days. And I had like seven fish in a row, 47 pounds. And he didn't get a fish fishing live blackfish. And he actually came up to me, he didn't know me, and he's like, what the hell are you doing? You know, and I, my standard answer is, I'm, I'm doing what I do best, I'm catching bass. So, I got, I got to like him, he was an old time, I, I got along with him. So I told him I was using porgies, and I gave him a couple, and he caught a couple big fish. The next, next time I go out, he comes right up to me, he goes, Bill. He goes, I'm catching my blackfish today. He goes, I got these some blackfish. I already have them. You know what I mean? So I was like, all right. But it just goes to show you, just because you caught them today on porgies don't mean you'll catch them tomorrow. You know what I mean? So it's your job to always change. I had another event one time. We are out in the ocean on a big bunker school, and we had big bass that day. In fact, we had, we had three fish over 50. But we're catching them on live bunker. And I had a big bait well in the boat, and I threw the cast net at a ton of bunker. And I must have had too many in the well because everyone's excited and we're all fishing. And all of a sudden, the bites slowed down. They grabbed the bunker, they run, they drop it. They weren't really taking it, you know. And I don't know why, but I figured I got rid of all the bunker. I emptied the well. I caught new ones and put them in as fast as I got them down out of bass. So there must have been too much ammonia in the water or something from that many bass. And I, I kind of learned that from fresh water somewhere in the back of my mind. I was reading about that in, in Lake Okeechobee in Florida one time where they couldn't catch these big largemouths on store-bought shiners anymore. They had to be caught in the lake because of the ammonia they gave off, and for some reason the fish realized that. Now, that's something you might never think of, but to me, the fish are always there, and you always have to catch them. The scenario remains, is the bottom covered with fish and I can't catch them, or am I doing everything right and there's no fish yet? So you have, the way to answer that question is very simple. If you fish one way and catch fish, there's always fish there. So if your system works over years, it will always work. If there's no fish, they're not there. It's, it's that simple. You know, people lose confidence. They're like, confidence is big. Like, if you fish a lure with no confidence, you won't catch a thing. It's rare. If you fish a lure that you love, you're like, oh, man, I'm going to catch a fish on this lure. So a friend of mine used to fish bucktail. He, he actually didn't fish bucktail. He used to come up on the bridge with us. And I used to beat these fish up on bucktails. And he would not use a bucktail. He was always looking for bucktail. Always looking for bucktail. And I used to tell him, I was like, Teddy, put a bucktail on. 
But he didn't know how to fish a bucktail. He had no confidence. He cast that. He snagged the bottom. He'd lose, he'd lose four or five bucktails a night, you know, they're four or five dollars a piece. He was like, I'm not fishing this crap no more, you know what I mean? It took him years to learn. And once he got good at it, he started to catch fish with kids. But if you don't have the confidence in anything you do, you know, if, you're on, if you don't like this lure, don't fish it. Or fish it to death until you get the confidence to either love it or hate it or adjust it. Like, how many guys fish bucktails? Oh, Jesus Christ, I love it. So, if you fish bucktails, how many guys fish pork right on your bucktails? Okay. If you fished a bucktail with no hair and no paint and a piece of pork rind, you would still catch fish because it's the pork rind that catches the fish. Or a trailer, whatever you may use. So the trailer helps. But of all you guys that fish bucktails, if you cut your pork rind down smaller, it will be every bit as efficient and you'll miss way less fish because now it's all hook. So I take all my pork rind, I cut it about two inches long. Now there's an exception to that. When there's a big bunker around, I'm going to fish a real big bucktail with a real long pork rind because you want to match the bait a little bit better. But there's a million times where most of our bait is small bait. So you want to take a bucktail, especially with a red piece of pork rind, because red pork rind disappears in the water column the fastest, and it becomes the profile of the lure gets smaller. So if you have really small bait, and you don't have really small bucktails, put a piece of red pork rind on it, cut it down small, and you'll shrink the profile of your lure, especially at night. Bucktails fish their very best at night. So if you, you can catch them all day and you catch them on the beach. The beach to me, I mean a lot of guys fish bucktails on the beach, but the best place to really beat fish up is a current. If you're in a current at night with bucktails and you have fish locked up, you can beat them to death. I mean, till you get tired of catching them. You know? but, but then you need the right water to do that. Questions? Yes, yeah, so you just started to talk about but I was going to ask you, you sounded mostly like a, a bait guy, but... I mean, bucktails. No, I fish, fish what, all in the fish. world of fishing, fish whatever you need to fish to catch fish. Also, fish what you have confidence in. I'm not a big plug guy because, in my opinion, where we fish, Montauk's different. But on the South Shore, plugs catch the least amount of fish, especially big fish. Because we no longer have those big active bait patterns with fish on them. You need fish feeding on bait patterns that have the plugs work correct. You know what I mean? So bait will outperform that for the most part. And I mean, these guys that fish plugged religiously, they tell me to catch fish. And some guys do. You know what I mean? If that's your gig and you're good at it and you got the confidence, yes, for you that works. You know? But they will normally outfish lures all the time on the bigger fish. And bucktails will catch the most fish if you know what you do. Like in my version of life, if you left me anywhere on planet Earth, leave me with a couple of bucktails. It's that simple. There's no lure that fishes better than a bucktail. It fishes every situation, but more so, it fishes things that are impossible to fish plugs. When you have a really strong tide, a moon tide, it's ripping so hard, if you're on the beach and you're throwing 10 ounces of lead and it's ripping, that, that's bucktail heaven. There, there's nothing that fishes better in a strong tide than a bucktail. It's the perfect lure, and most guys don't use it enough. You know what I mean? They, ju they just don't understand how, in fact, I was going to write a book on bucktail. Anyone read DeMeo's book on bucktail? What'd you think of? Great. He's a bucktail. John's book was such a high-level book that the average guy didn't know what the hell they were reading. And I mean that seriously. You have to be a very high-level bucktail to understand John's book in real detail because he was a really good bucktail. And most guys don't do that. And there's things you learn. There's things, like when you go through life and fishing, you guys fish braid, mostly? Yeah. I fish 50-pound mono with bucktails. I do stuff that you couldn't do with braid on the best day of life, and in the right conditions, I'll make the best bucktailer on the planet look stupid. Well, I can't really say that. I think I'm the best bucktailer. <laughs> <laughs> but, was that wrong? I'm not politically correct, right? Okay. So, but... What I mean by that is if you fish braid, and, and my version of life is you should know and have the exact reason why you fish something. Why are you fishing braid? Well, if I'm bucktail and fluke, I'm fishing braid because the thinner diameter allows me to use a lighter bucktail in shallow water. Home run, it works great. 
I don't believe in brain and bait on the beach. I see absolutely no reason for it at all. I want the stretch. I don't want no stretch because it puts a big hole in the fish's mouth. As everyone who's ever fished the beach knows, most of your biggest fish are lost right there in the wash because people get panicked, they get nervous, that big fish pulls down hard, they're like, shit, they get, and that big hole, the hook comes out of their mouth and they lose it. The stretch of the mono makes a difference, but in bucktailing, 50 pound mono floats a, a lure like you can't believe. So if you're fishing braid with a three ounce bucktail on a strong tide, you're hitting the bottom pretty quick. Me, I could sweep the bottom for a distance. That means my strike zone went from braid of being two feet to mono of being 25 to 30 feet. What a home run that is. And it's not in every situation, but in that particular situation, you can really beat the fish up. So if you've got, a, if you've got structure downside, and this is your structure, and the water's coming over like this, and the big bass is sitting right here, and you're fishing braid, you might hit the bottom too hard and you can't get it to float over. Well, there's an obstruction in it. With the, with the model, I just lift the rod like that, I can five feet off the model, and I fly right over the top, boom, you got a pass. So, it's not that you should just fish braid or you should just fish mono, maybe you should fish both and learn the difference. You know what I mean? Everything has an advantage. Guys that fish circle hooks, if you're not fishing a circle hook in a current, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Because what's the idea of a circle hook? A circle hook is designed for fish to eat the bait, run, and turn. And he hooks himself. If he doesn't do that, you don't hook him. How many times do you have a bite on the beach where it's like boing, bing, bang, boing? What are you going to do? You can't set the hook. You can't pull the hook with a circle hook. Who's going to ask a question? How do you work through the 25 to 35 pound bass? I water ski. If you want to know, when I fish big fish, I fish a Newell 344 with 50 pound test, 80 pound test leader, and I fish a Cal Star 30 to 80 blank. If he's 25 or 30 pounds, I'll have him on the surface in about 30 seconds and in a boat in about two minutes. So you literally work through fish after fish? Yeah, that's the idea. I grew up commercial bass fishing. I bought my first house cash at 19 years old from Cats and Stripe Bass. When we grew up, there were no cell phones, there was no computers. To this day, I fish a boat with no electronics. I have a digital deprivation. And there's no one alive that does that anymore. But I don't need that crap. There is no better computer on planet Earth than this. And we stopped using it. I had a noted guy that I won't mention his name fish right next to me while I had a 47 pound fish on talking to me. He had no idea I had a fish on. Because he's looking at all his machinery. There's a point in time where like the old Indians caught fish. They caught buffalo, they hunted. They didn't have any machinery. When I was a kid, we ran out direct. You know how we ran out? It was 2,800 RPMs for an hour and 10 minutes northwest. That's how you found them. And they caught fish. And so should you. And that's another good point. I will never run out to Montauk to chase fish. And why? Because I don't know the bite. I don't know the time. I don't know what they're catching them on. So to run out there because he told me there's fish, that means nothing to me. I know where my fish are here. If you have a best friend out there who says, listen, I'm catching them at nighttime at 3 in the morning on the top of the income and get down here, okay, that's fine. But if you run three hours that you just wasted, to go hope you catch, how many guys ran out to Montauk and never caught a thing? It's like, caught a fish out there, didn't get a bite, didn't get a bite, didn't get a bite. There's always fish somewhere. There's always a bite going on somewhere. If you fish your own backyard, that gives you tremendous time. If you work, you get off your job, you got three hours in the afternoon or at night, whatever. You have time to jump. I used to go every morning at 4 o'clock, I'm in the boat fishing or on the beach or on the bridge, whatever. I'm home by 7.30, I go to work. Because those three hours are productive. Whereas, if, what am I going to do? Run to Montauk? I spent three hours getting out there. I missed the bite. Oh, well. I'll try tomorrow. Well, the bite changed. So I never chase fish. Never chase fish. You know? And another thing, that old fallacy that the birds and the bass, 90% of all your biggest fish are caught in water where there is no sign of life ever. Because they, most of a bass's life is spent on the bottom. 99% of his life is on the bottom. For every big fish caught on a top water plug, there's 50 caught on the bottom. And that's just life of the way it is. If you like big fish on top and you want to watch them splash around, that's great. That's a lot of fun. But if you want to catch numbers of big fish, that ain't the way to do it.
are the biggest fish still coming through in the fall, late in the fall and maybe the early winter? But then, uh, Actually, we're running into trouble with that because we're starting to get a seal population, so it's uh, a little troublesome. And yes, there's still always big fish very late. But those aren't our fish. Those are fish from up north. Those are scragglers. That's not a bite that you can count on. That's a handful of real big fish. Like late in the year, around Thanksgiving and on, uh, if I go up every night for a week or two, I'll find a fish in the 50 or 60 pound box. Whether I catch them or not, maybe. But there's always a handful. But the best bite in the last five years has been in July. Here. It used to start in April. By May, by the first week of May, I mean, anyone who's been fishing any amount of time, it's May 8th was opening day forever. You know? And and now it's it's April 15th. But by May 8th, we used to be solidly into 30, 40 pound fish. And we don't get that no more. Now, I mean, you start hitting them late May at the earliest. Very red at them early. Jamaica Bay's at them early, but they stay there. Those fish don't move. So each area has its fish, you know what I mean? Depending on where you fish. Well, actually, it would never be a decrease. It would only be an increase. The only thing that decreases is catching. With the massive amount of bunker now and everybody on them, I mean, we live in a bubble, kind of, in the sense that you think of your areas where your fish are, but if you go down to Cape May, New Jersey, or you go down to Virginia, they're beating those fish to death. By the time they get up here, they, they drain half the population of fish on the bunker schools. <coughs> if anyone's fishing any length of time, 10 years ago, compared to now, the fishing flat out sucks on the bunker schools. You used to get out on them, you could get big fish as fast as you got on them. Now you got to go from school to school to school, hope you find one with bunker, you lack of bluefish. When did you see this many bunker with no bluefish on them? Yeah, that's what I comment. Is that a tribute to the population of bunker that we have now? No. Nah. Yeah. Nah, there's wrong with the bass population. Right. And sooner or later they're going to address that. We're having a problem and no one's addressing it, but they will. Because you know. when you shut the bass fishery down, what are you going to do next? You know what I mean? So we'll see what happens. Who else had a question? Yeah, I just want to ask you that Bucktail uh, book. Who was the author of it? John DeMayo. DeMayo. DeMayo wrote the only real Bucktail book I've ever read. The rest of the guys couldn't catch a fish in the aquarium. Are you familiar with the King Tide? No. It's, it's like kind of a half moon when the current line yeah. the sun Yeah, well, we call it different, okay. Okay, so I understand why Fuller. Well, it depends. You, you can catch fish on all tides, but, but as a rule, the most fish are always caught on the moon because of the water movement. But there are exceptions to that. In other words, what you're considering a king tide might work very well if your moon tide has such a strong current that the fish won't feed on it. There are times when a tide's so strong, the fish will feed at the very beginning and the very end of it, not during the main body of the tide. Then they're off that tide and they'll fish, and you'll catch them on, on the off tides. That's real common when you have a real, real strong tide. Yeah, yeah, and everywhere matters. In other words, water temperature matters dramatically. And water temperature in the spring, as you know on the North Shore especially, and on the South Shore too, if you're fishing a mud flat, as that tide, when that flat heats up, the tide you know, fills with water and gets hot and drains out, you could have a six to eight degree difference in water temperature from the bottom of the outgoing to the top of the incoming. Now that's tremendous. So if the fish... If your fish is, say your water's 48 degrees and 56 degrees, you want to fish the 56 degree water. You know, so you need to take the water temperature. And a lot, most people don't, don't take water temperature at all. They have no idea what the water temperature is. And that's just the surface. If you're really smart, get a thermometer and put it on the string and put it down. Leave it there a minute or two, bring it up, see what your water temperature is. Yeah, because the perfect water temperature for really big bass is like 64 to 66 degrees. From 62 to 68 is max. But that water temperature in that 64-ish, that is the best water temperature for really big fish. And when, you, when, when you're targeting big fish, fish for big fish. In other words, try to, it's hard to do, but just for arguments, if you're looking for a big fish, if anyone here wants a really big fish, 
Say you're in a bite of fish or whatever you're, you're doing and you're catching fish. There's a point in time you got to say, I had enough of catching these 20 pound fish, I want a big fish. So even among 20, if you're fishing bait, fish a big bait. Fish the biggest bait you can fish. Because you're taking the chance, first of all, if you fish a really big bait, you're, you're cutting down on a smaller fish taking that. The bigger fish also knows that bait's for him, he can take that. So fish the biggest bait you can fish. And there's no such thing as too big. I fish 17 inch blackfish and caught bass. You know what I mean? You can fish, I caught 16 inch fluke. I don't care how big the bait is, a bass will take it. Especially a big fish. And if there's no big fish, you won't catch them. That's fine too. But you can stand there and beat the shit out of 15 pound bass, or you can try for 150. Because if you catch a 50 the rest of your life, you'll never forget that. Nobody cares about your 20 pound fish. And that's just how life goes. You know what I mean? No, but he could be. He, he could be. As a rule, when bass travel, the big fish are in the front. As a rule. That's why I usually say sometimes your first fish is your biggest or your last. But once the fish are aggressively feeding, they move off. But then you got to figure stuff out. Like, even on those bunker bites, we were on the boat. We had a lot of big fish. That one year, uh, a guy named Charlie Taylor, I don't know if any of you guys know him, Johnny knows. I had a 64 pound fish, May 21st. Charlie had the same size fish a week later. We both had the fish in the dark. All my big fish were caught before the sun came up. As the sun came up, the fish got progressively small. By nine o'clock in the morning, the fish were all 25, 30 pound fish. But no one knew that because they weren't out in the dark. They go out in the daylight bunker fishing. All those big fish we had in the dark. And we had them for a couple of years like that. <coughs> So you got to put your time to figure stuff out. Never be standard. Never be casual. In other words, whatever you do, the, the, mark, the mark of a good fisherman is consistency. It's as simple as that. If you catch fish consistently, you're a good fisherman. I target big fish, so I catch big fish consistently, so I stepped it up a couple of levels. You know what I mean? But when, when, when you, when you want to get like focused, when you take a cast, Whatever you guess, it's never casual. Even if you make a mistake, remember everything you do because as soon as you catch a fish, re repeat that. You know what I mean? A mistake can be a pattern. Now, you're really going to plug it. You, you know, you get your eye and you, you itch it for a second, and you're real bang, you get a fish. You got a fish because you stopped the plug. You might not remember that. Some people just keep casting. Someone who pays attention will be like, shit, I, I stopped the plug. I'll do that again. There is no coincidences, everything is a pattern. That's why I tell, keep a log, write it down. I write down everything I do from it's cloudy, this, I thought this, I saw that, there was whales, there was porpoise, I saw this in the water. I write down everything. I don't know if it all matters at the end, maybe, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm like computer dumb, so. Maybe I get a young guy like you one day, give you all my logs, and put in a computer and see what you come up with. You know what I mean? And you'll be like, that fish bite this, 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 this is the wind, this is the, you know what I mean? But I've kept accurate logs for almost 50 years now. They're probably worse than when I'm dead. No. Okay. In other words, every day is different. In the world of fishing, there is no such thing as, I only do this. Because if you only do that, you only catch fish when they do that. It's that simple. These, these fish do it as smart as we are, as much as we think we know. They're still fishing, they do what they want to do. And they always will. Like, I'm on a bridge one night, and I tell the story a few times. And the bridge is lined with fish, and we're not catching. And I've been fishing the bridges my whole life. I'm fishing with my buddy Jeff. And uh, this young kid comes up who never really fished a bridge. And he casts a bucktail with no pork rind and reels it as fast as he can. Bang, he gets a fish. I was like, whoa, that's the first time I've ever seen it happen. Well, you know me. I cast, I, I left the pork rind out. I reeled. Uh, at the end of the night, I got like 15, 18 fish. This kid's got like three or four. My buddy's got none. On the way home, he gets mad at me. He's like, what the hell was that? I said, didn't you see what that kid was doing? He goes, yeah, but we never real fast. I said, today we did. Because there's no such thing as you know it all. If he's fishing a carrot with treble hooks and he catches a fish, I'm getting a carrot with treble hooks. You're never so smart that you know everything. None of us know everything. You have to adjust. Mistakes sometimes become patterns. Stupidity sometimes works tremendous. 
You know, they, when, when, if you had a big fish sitting in the shadow line, you're looking at it. There'll be a point in life where you use everything you own to try to catch that fish. And that's how we learn. But we get complacent. We go out there and we're like, you know, I, like guys tell me, I, I only fish this way. Then you only catch fish when they respond to that. The rest of the time you catch nothing. And, and the, the new wave fishermen don't, there's a handful of young guys that will become very, very good fishermen. The rest of them just wet their line, in my opinion, because they do the same thing every single, like I never put a rod in a rod holder in my lifetime. I hold my rod 100% of the time, otherwise I'm going home. Because the subtlest bites you'll never know. I've been on the beach with a guy's walk, he's looking for the shovel. Wham! The rod goes to the water, pops back up. He had no idea. He's looking for the <laughs> I've seen that happen so many times. If you were holding the rod, you would have caught the fish. And I'm there to catch fish. That's my job, finding the fish. That's rule number one. Above and beyond everything. Go find your fish. Who's going to ask a question? I will. Okay. Does color matter? All the time. Yeah. All White's number one, and you go anywhere you want from there. <laughs> How about the eyes? Listen, all that stuff is for fishermen. Because it sells. You don't need any. I did a seminar one time, but one of the seminar pros got mad at me because he says he doesn't fit bucktails when they get nicked and dented. Who cares? Fish don't care. Yeah. But it's that confidence thing. You know what I mean? But there are times color definitely matters. Like if there's baby weak fish around, yellow will have fish white. If there's bunker, it's white. If there's small bait, you better have red somewhere in your bunker. And there's another fallacy that some of you may disagree with me, but <clears throat> I've never seen big bass eat peanut bunker. I've never had a peanut bunker on a big bass in my life. And I've weighed in thousands of them. I worked at the Frank's Fishing Station, and we had every commercial gill netter and pinhooker in the area. And this is in the 60s and 70s. Bring me all their fish. I used to, my job was I stuck a fire hose down their throat, you blew out what was ever in their stomach, you packed them in boxes, you weighed them up, and you shipped them to the Fulton Fish Market. Never once. Did I see a peanut bunker in there? So, when you're catching big bass around peanut bunker, it's probably because they're eating little weak fish or some other little fish that's eating the peanut bunker. Because I think peanut bunker is the worst bait on planet Earth. It's as simple as that. Good for fluke. How about the 670s bunker? The candies? Yeah. yeah, they're fine. But my version of life, big fish, big bait. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, you could. Even if there's, you know, schools of that 670 That's a little better. Yeah, it's a little better. But you got to remember, one of the reasons, like he said, with eyes, game fish do lock onto the eyes if they're bait fish. Bass do not run through a school of bunker with their mouth open, hoping they get some. They will chase one individual bunker until they eat them, which is a lot of effort with a peanut bunker for a 50 pound bass to chase that little rat thing to get a meal. You know? It's like us chasing peanuts rolling on the floor, hoping you can catch them. It's crazy. What you mentioned you don't have to take off the horns, but when you're trying to identify a specific bait in that area, like middle of the fall, you have juvie weak fish, snappers, fluke, yep. porkies, everything is there. Do you just run through everything that's in your bag and try to match what those fish are on? No. No. You always start off with a pattern of what you're doing. In other words, the, it'll go more by color. Size doesn't always matter that much. Size seems to matter when they're feeding on very small bait sometimes, but overall, it really, it doesn't matter that much. Color will matter. You know what I mean? Like, I can't see if they're feeding on six different little species of bottom if you're using uh, a yellow plug. I mean, what, why does yellow work in Montauk or chartreuse? Like, there's no chartreuse fish here. You know? It's the way they perceive the color in the murky water. It shows up there, or whatever it is. But bait, you know, you can learn about bait. Like, probably no one does this, but if you go down and you take some clam, or for any dock, anywhere, where you would fish, or some worms, just put it on the bottom and start catching some of them little fish, see what's down there. You'll probably catch a little sea robin, you, 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 you catch a little uh, sea bass, all kinds of little creatures, and you'll see what's down there. You'll start to get an idea for what's in your area. Or go down like, go to Green Island, watch the guys, they're pulling out, like we went down there one day, that this one guy was fishing, he caught blackfish, sea bass, porgies, and blowfish. One after another, they were all little. But, but that's what's there, so you know you know what type of bait you have. But the main thing is you have bait. There's food. 
A fish, all you need to know as a fisherman is where these fish eat it. If they're covering the bottom and sleeping, who cares? You can't catch them. I can only catch them when they're eating. So what are they eating? Where are they eating it? And that's where you need to be. And that goes by tide. The tide will determine the bite. In other words, the tide is the bite. The tide creates the bite. The bait and size of it tells you what size your fish are. If you have a ton of little tiny bait, your chances are there's not a lot of big fish there. You know? If you have big bait, you can have some big fish. If there's fish eating the small bait, you could still have big fish. But you need, you need bait, because these fish are aggressive feeders. They eat a lot. You know, if you caught 30 fish on a tide that were 35 to 50 pounds, do you know how many fish had to be in that school for you to take 30 of them out of that school? And how much bait is there? They eat five pounds of bait. You know, we've caught, everybody's caught a, a good-sized bass with fluke. I've caught bass with three or four full-sized fluke in them. I mean, these fish can eat. So once they run out of their food pattern, they're going to move along to the next food pattern. And it's your job to find it. And the wind will tell you where the fish, everything's connected. In other words, just as a general scenario, we have a day bite on a new moon on an outgoing tide. And, and one of the reasons the outgoing tide is so good around here is because if you look at all our drops on the south shore, they all face south. So when the water goes this way and drops, that's where the bass are because they're structure fish. When it goes the other way, there's no advantage. They lost their advantage. So everything, everything is relevant to the structure of your fish, the tide of fish, and that's not a hard thing to figure out. Like you said, when you're running around, if you fish the same area and, and put some time in, You'll start to figure out, this beach has fish, this beach isn't that good, there's much better structure. If you're fishing a beach that has really good structure and a storm comes through, it could wipe it all out in two minutes, and it's done. That means you're done with that beach until it reforms, go find another one. It's that simple, you know, because structure is the name of the game. Uh, how about lobster? Anything to say about yeah, they love lobster, we just don't have any here. If you want to go buy them and use them, go ahead. <laughs> In the 1800s, okay, that's all they did is fishing. A bass, listen, in, in the truth of the matter, a bass is an opportunity feeder, and they will eat almost anything that crosses their path. But they also get particular. That's why they're so much fun to catch, because they'll eat anything, but today they might only eat this. So that's where the dilemma comes in. But they basically, if you put it in their face, they're going to eat it. And if they don't, they get particular, and that happens. But more times than not, they'll eat whatever comes past them. Because they live in an environment where their entire life is no more than looking for food. So it's hard to turn it up unless there's so much food that they key on on this bait and they're not getting off. You know, that's why sand eels are such a great bait because they don't go anywhere for a week or two. They stay put. It's not like Bunker where you know, they're here today and an hour later they're two miles down the beach. The sand eels don't move for a week. They stay right where they are. And the fish stay there and just gorge themselves. when there's a good bite going on, we'll just sit back. They're not going to, it's no more than, listen, if someone threw a bunch of nickels and dimes on the floor, the older people ain't going to run up and go chase them when the kids again. You know what I mean? Maybe after a we'll walk by and pick one up. <laughs> and it's kind of that simple. Because all big bears are female. Every single one of them. Every single big bear is a female. And they're big and they're fat and they're lazy. So anything that's big and fat and lazy has to be efficient or it'll die in the ocean. So big bass are very efficient feeders. They rarely miss what they're, what they're aiming for. They eat it in a short window of the tide. If you're tied six and a half hours, real big fish might only feed for 15 or 20 minutes of that tide. They're going to get their food and they're done. That's it. So you have that open window to get a real big fish. And here's the second thing I'll tell all you guys to say no. And yeah. A lot of times when you got a really good bite with big fish, you get a real monster about it. 15 to 20 minutes into the next time. 
when it all ends, and the fish will almost always end on the tide. In other words, the bite will almost always end when the tide ends. But if there was a real big fish around, if you're, if you're fishing bumper, put a half a bumper on, just leave them. Your chance to catch a really big fish are excellent in the next 45 minutes. So you're saying if there's an end of the outcome bite, say the last two hours, and you're catching decent fish, and you want to catch the big one, it's most likely going to be when the current starts up again in the incoming or the next outcome? It could be either at the end of the bite, because the big fish mosey around. And the reason I know that, when we were chunking, we would catch some of these very big fish, they had like 30 pieces of chum in That means they were there the entire time. And after the main body stopped feeding, they moved forward. And then you get them. And it's always in that 45 minutes from when the tide ends to when the next tide starts going. So if there's a frenzy at the end of the hour, Stay there. Fish that first You bet. The yeah, you got nothing to lose. You got nothing to lose. Regardless of tide or, or, or current speed or whatever, Take June or July, you know, uh, noon, one o'clock. Sun's being down. I'm mean, on the beach. You don't have the benefit of the boat to go to the yeah. water. You're catching fish at that time. You bet. Really? Yep. Because it has nothing to do with twelve o'clock in the afternoon. And that heat. It doesn't. doesn't that doesn't phase them. The sun doesn't phase. We had a bite at Gilgo one day. It was in August, middle of the day, hundred degrees, middle of the day, dead low tide, dead low tide, the hottest the water can be. All big fish. And then sun. All big fish. Doesn't matter. In fact, on the beach, which I consider vastly different than a boat, I've caught more big fish in dead flat water on the beach at dead low tide than any other time. In hot weather. Yeah. And it's never a great bite. It's a handful of big fish. You get one or two big fish. But never a bite. Yeah. But who knows why they do that? I don't know. Somebody once told me that bunker catches bigger bass, clams catch more bass. Why is that? Well, I don't know if they catch more, but bunker definitely catch way bigger fish. There's a lot of fallacies in fishing, just so you know. <laughs> Guys, they tell you in the spring a bass's mouth is soft, you need clams. That's a bunch of crap. I've caught tons of big fish in, in early April on bunker. So, bunker will always catch big fish because that's their mainstay. Clams are not the mainstay for big fish. The little fish like. But the bottom line is you can catch a big fish on a clam. But if you fish clams your whole life and I fish bunker my whole life, I'd have thousands of bigger fish than you. Literally. Because that makes the difference. But then if you're a good bucktailer, you have more satisfaction than a bait fish. So if you get really good at bucktailing, there's no better smile than to catch a big fish by yourself in the fast tide and no one's there but you. It's like, yeah. In the middle of the night. And there's not a lot of night fishermen left anymore. I go out at night now, there's like nobody out there. I mean, I understand all you old guys like me can't see no more. But, but the young guys, you should all be out there at night. Yeah. All right, are we good? Anything else? Any more questions? How do you feel about pulling wine? Trolling? Yeah. Real productive. My personal life, I, have, I will fish any way I have to fish to catch fish. If the fish are on the wire, I'll pull one. You know, I, I'm not one of them people that's a purist. My, my version of life is catch fish. The bigger the better. The more the merrier. You can't catch enough. You bet. Do you pull up relatives? No. That's little fish. That's right. That's little fish. You're better off fishing a big tube than you are an umbrella if you want a big fish. Big tube will outfish an umbrella all day long for big fish. But the spoons out fish them all. But it is nice purple purple tubes, man, too. Big purple tube. But those guys fish tube and one, that works real good. But everything is your area, everything is what you fish. You know what I mean? Like me personally, I I've been I still have dozens of old lupo spoons. Yeah, you know, today they switched to what spoons you guys use now? Yeah. So it all depends what you like and what you have the confidence in. They'll all catch. All right, listen, Mikey, my buddy Mike, printed out some of these things on basic bait. We got digger crab, which we call mole crab. Pictures of, uh, these are little baby barracuda, if you've ever seen them. We were on a dock one time, but it's, it's, in, it's in the middle of the night, me and Mike are on this dock. And we're walking down, and there's these little baby uh, barracuda, and they're alive. Some are dead, 
I'm like, what the hell are they doing on a doctor at two in the morning? You know what I mean? And then one flips back in the water and dawns on me. I stand back, I look, three bass running right along the line of the dock. They hit these these little barracuda, they fly out of the water and land on the dock, so make it back some day. I was like, look at that. Then we got mantis shrimp, kingfish. We'll print up more for next time. I wish I knew that projector, it makes them clear. Baby weak fish and finger mullet. So if any of you guys want to know what this looks like, they're up here, you can have them. Take one. I don't know if there's enough for everybody. Thank you. Good fishing to you. I hope you get a monster.